Very provocatively, uh, especially for some of your readers who commented, you use the word cult in your title. Um, And I wanted to ask about that. Uh, We talk a lot about cults on this podcast. Uh, I I identify as a cult survivor. I've studied it quite a bit. Um, Now, you know, you describe not having done the Waldorf training before your hire, but that there were strong pressures to take it if you were to advance professionally. So this does feel like a a slow induction process. And I'm wondering what would happen organizationally and financially to the Waldorf schools if the training was a prerequisite. Would it not work uh, to just be to, to ask people to go from teacher's college straight into Waldorf training? I think that these schools would fail. Um, there are not enough. It, let me be clear. I think that requiring teacher training before hiring Waldorf teachers um, would, would cause the schools to have absolutely no faculty to, to fill the ranks. And, and that was, public conversation. Again, as I was discussing with these training programs and and talking with my school and with other Waldorf teachers as well, it was common knowledge that Waldorf schools are increasingly being staffed by non-Waldorf trained teachers. And and that's a supply and demand problem, um, that there actually aren't teachers completing those training programs at the rate required. Um, and, And so that created, at least in the school where I worked, a a divide, right? And a cultural kind of tension between those who felt, those Waldorf trained teachers who felt they were carrying the torch and doing the good Lord's work, if you will. And um, those teachers who had been hired on their merits as, you know, experienced teachers, um, you know, writers, et cetera, experts in their field who were being, uh, I mean, this is strong language, but to some degree, I think it is fair to call it, you know, they were being treated as second class citizens within the faculty culture, you know, and there would be comments about, oh, you know, well, they're not trained, you know, or just wait until you finish your training and then you'll understand, or, oh, we can have that conversation after training. Um, This idea that you silly, you know, especially, especially I want to add, there is a kind of anti-intellectual bent to it, especially if the teachers like me had a PhD and no Waldorf training. And so there was this real tension between, oh, you know, actually my, the, the master Waldorf teacher who I, um, who was my mentor uh, early on said to me, you know, your PhD is, is worthless. That's not what we're doing here. That's a powerful statement. Yeah, it was hurtful. It was very hurtful. And, but it also allowed me to see the perspective of what was valued at the place of, of, of my employment. Um, And that if it wasn't, you know, my education and, and experience as a teacher, then what the heck was it? And that's, you know, how I really started to understand these other objectives. And there was no way that you were going to advance, of course, without acquiescing to the spiritual training. I wouldn't have been department chair. I wouldn't have been um, a leader of the College of Teachers. Uh, the College of Teachers is a kind of self-governing body in many Waldorf schools. Um, and, and yeah, just looking around at the facts of, you know, who, who was in charge of those really influential positions, um, I thought there's nowhere for me to go here. Now that's, you know, at the same time, there were, some administrative positions that had recently been um, filled with non-Waldorf trained folks. Um, But that was a nearly a crisis, nearly a community dividing crisis, you know? And so again, I'm going, okay, well, that's not going to be a good place for me either. 
you know. There's a theorist called Michael Langoni who describes the three key aspects of the cultic organization as uh, deception, dependence, and dread of leaving. And I think that your article hits on two out of the three. So you describe this kind of deceptive induction into anthroposophy as a faculty member and also the deception of secular progressives who are looking for a tuned and outdoorsy and child-centered education. Um, you also describe a faculty that develops a kind of uh, enforced uh, social dependency on the ideology. You've just described, you know, that it would limit you economically if, if, you, didn't, if you didn't fully buy in. What about dread of leaving? Was it hard for you to leave? What were the consequences, like beyond the typical career disruption that would come from quitting any job? I think if I hadn't also been a parent at the school, uh, the decision to leave would have been less complicated. And, and so I think that that's probably an essential part of sustaining this institution is bringing um, teachers and their children together into the organization because my fear of leaving was not primarily about not being able to find another job or, or whatever you, you know, as you mentioned, other kind of normal professional anxiety. I had a, a, a child at the time in um, first grade who had been at the Waldorf school all through, you know, the, the three year kindergarten and, and had progressed into the grade school and therefore had received no formal training in forming letters, reading, you know, except for, of course, what I had provided at home, which was reading every night and, you know, trying to get him to do workbooks for fun and flashcards and that sort of thing. But the fact was that that did not substitute for formal education in phonics and literacy and language. And so as a first grader, imagining moving my son or, or, you know, imagining moving my first grade son into uh, a, you know, traditional learning environment was terrifying. That was dreadful. I thought, what in the world have I done to handicap my son in such a way that he is unable to, you know, seamlessly transition into another educational program without significant support and, and, you know, individualized attention, et cetera. I I was, that was the part that made me dread it. I, I hoped that I could just, um, keep at it long enough for my son to learn how to read. And if only my son could learn how to read, then I could quit. Um, and that actually was, I mean, dread is the accurate word there. It was dreadful. I, I was um, scared, anxious, worried, horrified, regretful of the decision I had made. Um, and when I, in hindsight, step back and look at that, I realize how insidious that is institutionally to set up your elementary school program so that it is prohibitive of children seamlessly transitioning from your school to anywhere else. And that was actually not um, something that they kept a secret. They, they actually did say that in, in admissions meetings and things that don't worry, your children will catch up by third grade. In third grade, they'll be at the same level as public schools. It was something they weren't weren't, uh, ashamed of. 